Welcome to this Unitarian Universalist of Transylvania County Sunday service. All of you present here and those of you watching remotely, please know that you are all welcome here. Whoever you are, whomever you love, no matter your age, class, or gender, or whatever spiritual paths you may have traveled, you are welcome. Our faith calls us not to a particular creed, but to a covenant to honor every person's worth and dignity. Good morning. I am Alice Hardy, and I am a member of this congregation. There are a few announcements before we begin our service. Reverend Bob is collecting names of people who are interested in the formation of a grief group. Once he has enough interest, he will offer the best times to offer this supportive circle. And now, a few weekly housekeeping announcements. For our good health and safety during this next normal, please wear masks while in the building, unless, of course, you're up here speaking. Use the clipboards at the end of your rows to sign your name and telephone number in case contact tracing becomes necessary. Offering baskets won't be passed from hand to hand, but you can drop your contributions and your name tag into the baskets or bowls at the doors when you are exiting. And this month's special collection is to benefit our neighbors at El, El Centro. So please enjoy the music. Um, singing is not done live in our building yet, but I am told that you can dance and clap along if you are so inclined. Um, after the service, please exit the building quickly between services 
to allow for more complete air exchange. Now we will listen to our own a cappella choir sing the first hymn for today, number 388. Our opening words this morning are by Ken Nye. Someone told me once that Einstein thought time is a variable. That is to say that time is not a constant. Um, are you following me here? Um, because I think Einstein was right. When I was a child, a year was a year. Now a year is a week. When I was a child, a week was a whole bunch of days of limitless possibilities, so numerous that I planned ahead only as far as the afternoon. Now a week is a few meetings interspersed with frenetic activity that I have apparently convinced myself is very important. Well, never mind enjoying the moment. Never mind stopping to smell the roses. Yesterday, a lifetime was forever immeasurable, like a light year. But today, swirling in a mix of tomorrows and yesterdays, a light year is, is comprehensible. It's measurable, and it's finite. <laughs> Let's not talk about cosmic stuff. Let's not throw in big words to impress. Because if Einstein was right, and I think he was, where is the throttle? How do I slow this stuff down? Let us slow down now 
as we move more deeply into our worship service by lighting our chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Our words are by Maureen Killeran, a retired UU minister. Jim Hardy will help me light the chalice. The poet Langston Hughes has written, hold fast to your dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. So may this chalice challenge each of us to cherish our dreams for all things worth doing begin in the courage and the inspiration of a dream. In our community, we make time to share pieces of our lives with one another. When we were all together on Sunday morning, pre-pandemic, this was a whole lot easier. Now I ask that if you wish, those of you watching from afar, please reach out to one another via the chat function or submit news of your joys and concerns to the Loving Hearts and Helping Hands team or to Reverend Bob. Reverend Bob wishes us to light a candle for all the people of Transylvania County who were badly affected by the flooding and storms this week, as well as those up and down the coastal states. We're going to do a little something different this morning with the rest of the candles. We're going to make some silent space. Jim Hardy will light four candles separated by a moment of silence, allowing each of us, through prayer and meditation, to hold dear the joys and concerns within our heart. The fourth silence will be followed by the musical interlude number 1043, performed by the wonderful talents of Janice Kennan, Elaine Shaver, and Carlene Reagan. I am delighted to welcome back to our pulpit our guest speaker and good friend of UUTC. Reverend Philip Thomason is a graduate of Emory University with an undergraduate degree in education and a master's in divinity and psychology. 
He served as a clinical chaplain and adult in pediatric oncology, along with being the spiritual director of the adult and pediatric hospice programs located at Emory University Hospice. He and his husband, Rick, share a delightful schnauzer, who I yet have not met, by the name of Eleanor, named after Eleanor Roosevelt. Reverend Thomason visits always leave us with renewed joy and much wisdom. After his message, he will give some closing words, and we will close the service with the hymn, The Lone Wild Bird. I welcome Reverend Thomason. Good morning. It's good to see you again after it seems years, but it's not really been a year. It's been a year, but still, it's good to see each of you. I was outside at my house the other night, and I live kind of up in the mountains, and I saw two fireflies. Before that, I'd seen numerous fireflies, and it always been rather happy that they were still there. And the other night, there were two just kind of flittering around outside my front door. And I thought of something that my mom said to me many years ago. I hadn't thought about it probably in 60 years. And it's amazing how things just kind of creep into the back of your mind when you hadn't thought about them in so long. I had two twin sisters that were younger than I, but we enjoyed each other immensely. We would play outside at night and my mom would bring us a jar, each of us, and she would tell us, now catch as many, she called them lightning bugs, as you can catch. And we'll see at the end who wins the prize. Well, we would spend, it seemed, hours, and I'm sure it was probably a couple of minutes, catching lightning bugs. And in the end, she would count the, the, the lights in there, and our prize was, you know, a kiss from her, a nickel from her, a, uh, a treat the next day, whatever it was. We were always happy for that. But then I remember one night, that I left my jar on the back porch. And after I had gone to bed, she came in and woke me up and said to me, are you gonna leave the light on all night? And I really didn't know what she meant. And so she took me out and showed me the jar with the lightning bugs in it. And she said, you must set them free. How would you like to be in a jar and your light not be free? It's one of those things that you've got to do. So we need right now to set your lightning bugs free. Let them be free with the world in which they are. And you always remember, don't ever put your light in a jar. Close the top on it and never set it free. Why did I remember that all these years later? I have not thought of that in, like I said, 60, 65 years I've not thought about it. But it was there the other night when I saw two final lightning bugs of the season probably go by my house, twicking their little lights. It's amazing to me what we think about. It had been a long, long week at Emory University Hospital. I was one of the chaplains there in pediatric oncology and adult oncology, and even worked with the hospice as their spiritual director for both adults and for children. So when you spend your time on oncology floors and in oncology pediatric hospices, you are pretty worn out by the end of the week. At Embry, the way that you worked it, you came into work on Monday, you would go home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and if your rotation rolled around, 
Then you were there Friday night, Saturday. You were there Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night, and you could go home on Monday. They provided you a room with a bed, so you got to act like you would get some sleep at least. But I remember that you carried pagers then. There were no such thing as a cell phone that would call you. So you had this belt full of pagers. And on the weekend, you were responsible for more than just your unit. So not only was I responsible for oncology, both pediatric and adult, I was responsible for the transplant unit, for this unit, for adult psych unit. So you, it looked like you were of the wild, wild west. You had so many pagers on, and you really didn't know which one. You'd have to go through them, figuring out who they were and what they were. But that night, about 3 o'clock, it was a Saturday evening, the pager went off. And any time you looked at the pager and you saw that it was the children's hospital up the street, there was something in you that changed immediately. It just changed. Even with me being there the majority of my time there, still something happened if the pager in the middle of the night came from the children's hospital up the street from the major university hospital. I don't know how many of you have ever seen Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, but it's numerous buildings that are all connected underground by tunnels. You never have to go outside. You can go from this hospital to this one to this one to this one, and you never, ever have to leave. And in some cases, it's good on those cold, winter, rainy nights, but on the nights that it is lonely and the nights that you're tired and the nights that you're, it's not a very pleasant place to be. They were not well lit. And as you walked from one hospital to the other, all you could hear were the sounds of your footsteps going down these long hallways. But I noticed that night that my pager said to go to the conference room in the children's hospital in Henrietta Eggleston Children's Hospital. Now, I'd been all over that hospital. I had been all over it, but I'd never, I'd never been called over the years to go to the conference room in the middle of the night. And as you're going, you're wondering what's going to happen, what's going to take place, I don't know, which led the fear to be a little more in your heart. Well, I got to the door of the conference room, and I was so tired. I'd been on call all weekend, I'd been there all week, and I go to the door and I thought, now, what am I going to find behind this door? What's going to be there today? And I opened it up, and I saw a room filled with people, African-American people, and I was the only Caucasian. A young man who was a chaplain who came into this not really knowing what to do or what to say. And lying on a makeshift altar was the body of a, of, a, of a baby. And as I came in, I'm sure that I looked somewhat taken aback. But from over on the right, a woman by the name of Gloria came in. And she came up to me and she said, and I will never forget, baby, you look tired. And I said, well, it's, it's been one of those weeks. It's been a tiresome week. And not only do you look tired, but you look afraid. Now, she had hit the nail on the head. I was not only tired, I was afraid of what was going to take place during the night that I was going to be responsible for. She said, you need to rest. But before you rest, we've got to get this baby to heaven. She said, go on up, go on up and look at Isaiah. And so I went up and I saw this baby that had been born. And I thought, now what am I to do? They didn't, they didn't teach me this in seminary. 
They didn't teach me this when I got my master's. They surely didn't teach this to me when I worked on my PhD. They just didn't. I didn't know what to do. And again, Gloria came over and said, baby, you look tired. Are you sure you're all right? Well, not only, again, was I tired, but I was very afraid. So I turned to her and I said, now, now tell me what I need to do. Because I, I truly don't know. And she said, we would like for you to take that baby, to take that baby named Isaiah and lift that baby to heaven and offer him to God. I thought, can I do it? Will I be able to do that? So she came up with me. She stood there with me as I picked Isaiah up, and I offered Isaiah up to God, and I heard, Jamba! 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 And the whole room started swaying back and forth. You've seen the Lion King. You remember when the baby lion was offered up. That's what it was like that night. Except this baby was being offered to God. As the room swayed and the people moved and the happiness took over, the tears began and I realized what I had been called to do at that point. I realized what God had put me in that position for on that night. Gloria said again to me, you sure you're all right, baby? Never call me by my name. That's the reason I told you this morning. When you said to me, you all right, Reverend Honey? <laughs> I thought, There's, that's wonderful. It's wonderful. Gloria cared about me, even though I really didn't know what to do or what to say. Gloria cared about me. She loved me. She had compassion for me. And she understood that I needed rest. You know, in my tradition, there's a story of Jesus being on the boat with his disciples. And he looked at them and he said, you all have been out doing my work all over the place. And it's time that you get some rest. So let's row this boat over to the edge of the shore. And I want you to find your spot and I want you to rest. Just simply rest. But by the time they got to the shore... All of the people who had been following them around saw them coming. And they met Jesus and his disciples on the edge of the shore. And the first thing they wanted was, Jesus, please heal us. We need to be healed. Not only of physical ailments, but of spiritual problems of problems that exist deep in our soul. Some of us are so tired that we don't know what to do. And there were people, and this is one of my favorite stories, there were people in there who traveled and followed Jesus around just to touch the hem of his garment. They knew if that happened... If they could only reach out and touch the hem of that garment, that they would be healed. Now, that's my tradition. That's where I came from. That's what I grew up with. But that night on the way back to the hospital, down that long, long corridor that seemed to be 150 degrees, there was only a couple of lights in your footsteps behind you. I realized what had happened that day. I realized that there, there, there was a woman by the name of Gloria who became that Jesus to me, 
whoever that person is in your life that has caused you to understand you are a and in a bigger place than just what you think you're in. Have you met those people? They, you may have met them in books. You may have met them through the scripture. You may have met them through the poems of, of Langston Hughes. You might have met them anywhere along the way. But they're the people that offer you compassion. They're the people who offer you love. They're the people who offer you caring. I've been blessed in my life to come and be with people like that. Just seems like it's magical in certain ways that I'm able to find myself in a position that I meet folks like that. Who it seems that their main goal is to take others and to say to them, you look weary. You look tired. You need to be loved. You need to be cared for. And we need to share the love that we have with you. Many years ago, I took my mom, many years ago, during the AIDS epidemic, to New York to see plays. She had never gone anywhere. She grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, raised five kids, sent us all to college. She was a good mother. She had taught me the wise things that I needed to know. The things about loving and caring for people that I needed to know. She had taught me those things. But we're going down Fifth Avenue one day, and as we walked past, there was a man sitting in the street with a sign that said, I have AIDS and I'm dying. Anything that you can give, I would appreciate. Now, I saw my mom reach into her purse, pull out a handkerchief, and cover her nose as she walked by this man and walked up the street. I thought, that's not the woman I remember. And after I caught up with her, I said, what was that all about? I didn't know that I might not catch it. Kind of ring a bell? Kind of ring a bell about the way that we're living today? That we might not catch it? I don't get it. I don't understand it. But what I do understand is this. That as people, people of God, that we are called to do great and wondrous things. And through those things, you and I can do great and wondrous things in this world in which we live. How do you know that in your life or in my life, you have not been a Gloria to somebody? How do I know in my life and or in your life that you have not been one of those people that have been called to go into the world and to make changes in the world? But you know, to do that calls you to rest. And it causes you to have to have compassion for other people. Now, maybe I'm talking to the choir this morning. But it seems to me that you and I are living in a time right now that compassion and love for others seems to be flying out the window over some small and insignificant things. People of God, hear these words. Baby, you look tired. Come on and rest. Here's the key. After you do what needs to be done. You share your love. You share the compassion that needs to be shown. And only then, only then, as people gather together, as brothers and sisters in one, can we go into the world and do great things. It is a joy to be here. It is always 
a joy to be in this. When I came in here this morning, the first thing that I thought of was, isn't this one of the most peaceful places that I think I've been in in a long time? And you are blessed people. And you know what else I know? I know you are not only blessed people, but you are people that go into the world and do those things that we're called to do. I, know, I keep tabs on you. I watch all the time on Sunday morning, or I go and watch at a later date. I know what you do. I know the wonders that exist within this spot. I know the wonders that exist in this beautiful music. I know the wonders that exist when you care for others. It is evident. And you know who I think you are? I think you're this town's glorious. Baby, you need to rest. You need to love. And you need to care. People go into the world and do great things and offer those unto God.